Okay, so our, uh, yeah, like I mentioned, no financial disclosure or conflict of interest. Here is our land acknowledgement. Uh, the League of Canadian Poets would like to acknowledge that our organization is situated upon the traditional territories. The territories include the Wendat, Ashinaabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Mississaugas of the New Credit, and the Métis Nation. The treaty that was assigned for this particular set of lands is collectively referred to as the Toronto Purchase and applies to the lands east of Brown's Line to Woodbine Avenue north towards Newmarket. The League of Canadian Poets recognizes the enduring presence of Indigenous people on this land. The League also recognizes that art, poetry, and poetic practice related to the work of our organization takes place in traditional territories of many different nations. We encourage each attendee here today to learn more about the treaties and histories of Indigenous people tied to the lands where you live and work. If you have a land acknowledgement that you would wish to share, that you wish to share, please drop it in the chat. And I would also like to take a moment to encourage everyone to continue our allyship and um, support of Indigenous people and people and communities by donating your time, money, and resources to Indigenous organizations that are grassroots to where you are and where you live. Thank you. And here we have one little statement on mitigating potential bias. I'm just going to go right ahead and read it. Each presenter has been given instructions about the conflict of interest prior to their proposed session date. Included in this package are instructions um, on how to mitigate bias in their presentations. Through this process, we endeavor to, present, to prevent any perceived or real conflicts of interest. However, if there are any and become apparent during the session, please alert me and I will uh, intervene. I'm not too concerned, honestly. All right. And now I'll take a brief moment to introduce our presenters. And I'm just gonna go ahead and spotlight them for you so we can all take a look at their lovely faces. There we are. So S.K. Hughes is a physician, activist, and poet living in Hamilton, Ontario in Treaty 3 land. Her poems have been published in the Heart House Review, Canadian Family Physician, Half a Grapefruit, and others. She was also the founder and editor-in-chief of now-finished feminist art mag Milkweed Zine. At present, she spends most of her time trying really, really hard to be a good doctor. Shane Nielsen is a poet, critic, and physician from New Brunswick. He co-authored Poetry in the Clinic, Towards a Lyrical Medicine, with Alan Bleakley. In a few months, Goose Lane Editions will publish You May Not Take the Sad and Angry Consolations, which has already been named a poetry collection to watch by CBC. Shane is disabled and autistic. I want to take a quick moment to read you guys the, um, the paragraph about Shane's new collection because I think it sounds really exciting and definitely worth checking out. Conceived as an archive of wisdom written by a disabled man for his children, Shane's collection, You May Not Take the Sad and Angry Consolation, gives voice to the experience of living in an ableist society. Why does it hurt when emotion spills out of a body? How does emotion spell body? What does it mean to be good? Why is the surplus of beauty everywhere? And what is the password? Weaving together reflections on fatherhood, Walt Whitman's place in American history, art and the lingering effects of past trauma, these ringing and raw poems theorize on the concept of shame, its intended purpose, and its effects for and on disabled bodied minds. I will uh, drop a link in the chat to that momentarily so we can all get mutually excited about that. All right, one last thing for me until I leave us off to our presenters. And um, that is just a brief overview of what we'll be talking about this evening. So tonight, S.K. Hughes, a practicing family physician, will read poems that are in relation to her identity and medical training. Shane Nielsen will read parts of a lyric essay that explores what thinking poetically meant and continues to mean at different stages of his medical career. The format alternates such that Dr. Hughes will read poems pertaining to a particular stage of training, and Dr. Nielsen will read lyric fragments that explore what being a poet even meant then in his corresponding, but not commensurate, medical context. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here tonight. And uh, Shane and SK, please uh, take it away. And last name is Canadian, too. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm SK Hughes. I'm going to read some poems in three parts to you. 
um, and I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. Okay. A, a thousand tiny tongues of sleep lap up my awareness and lift me into their stomach. A roint. Inside, I find a few frames of alleyways, frightened faces, and bloody bile before a, a groaning heave expels and compresses me. The jolt leaves my trunk swirling with what white violence. I invite the tongues to mend me, present my salty flesh. They flick and tease and I bend to their whims if they will consume my fatigue. The tongues take pity on me and pleasure in the great gut's pain. And this is summer creatures. Summer creatures creep out slow and thick. Medicines wick a transient drip. Crank calendula in every crevice, like gem filled all the holes. Sew me back up, crammed with gut and grit and soft boiled steel. Eggy wegs and kefir on muesli with the little cubed apricots. Morning meals I've watched men scarf. Jem said I stood way up on the book fair pillar because of my Leo rising. And that he left me because he's a Gemini. I stitched the twins onto the little bag I made for his Yodorowski deck. It's been near a year and my eyes are itching again. Ragweed out in coots, roots filtering the industrial filth, sending up the pollen that puffed my face at his place. There's lithium and amethyst, sunflowers can turn their heads moon-faced and beaming. And this is Hamilton. I rode, I rode east on the Barton bus with Jem, specter of professionalism newly hitched to my heart, past Hamilton Strip, Mary Street, the General, a town of Catholics, hair fresh dyed, washed, hiding lavender wisp that might give me away. You can tell a lot about a place by its bus ads, he said, eyes eyeing the sloped, sloping ceiling. I saw myself tattooing my ankles, spilling secrets into zines. The wide rectangular ads hanged over us. Pornography hurts and a charcoal sketch of a weeping child. They will hate me. And this is emulsion. I scrub my scalp with just my fingers, like in the lake with the kids teaching them to dive down and scoop and scoop handfuls of sand to grind onto their pits, coaxing some wildness from their preteen pride. Now I scrub in a shallow tub, tarnished, not gleaming like in the city. I shaved my head full Britney after Jen left. Put away the tresemme, not tested on animals, but sulfates and laurel unwreathed. Wynne says that Dr. Bronner's will strip the good stuff too harsh and they like the smell of dirty hair. My first patient in, in Emerge, drunker than she would admit, said, I love your hair and your nose ring. Hepatic encephalopathy with codeine bunging her up, the shit somehow swelling her brain. I wore earrings with my scrubs to avoid the embarrassment of being called sir. Theirs, not mine. The oils from my scalp emulsify in the lavender bath water. Detergent on my fingertips rinsed before another go to get the dirty hair smell out and smell more like a doctor should. Water slapping itself sounds tinny, but warmer, like a coin spinning on polished pine. And I'll hand it over to Shane. <clears throat> Biomedical time, zero to four, medical school. Poetry is secret sharer as informant on the self, as reading, as writing, as speech, as something I carried in a little book while on the wards, losing it in a patient's room one day, only to have it mailed to me 10 years later by a nurse who found it in the new Halifax infirmary. The briefest of notes accompanying the return, the writing in that book, block printing, neat, the kind of care demonstrated with the script, something I've long since lost, writing somehow predating the later scramble. Poetry is useless doctrine and welcome 
time waster. As my mind went sideways, as my distractor during requisite distraction, a means to consider medicine's semiotics and not its content, while attending lectures that delivered content, or in the several city hospitals with a more embodied content, not its outcomes, no, but its constellation of meaning, studying how medical discourse could be essentialized, mastering it so that I could pretend to mastery of medicine itself, to appear smart as my only protection. Whereas any other normate was much preferred in medical space by dint of being able to implicitly, intrinsically, reflexively relate. Poetry is perpetual quest to define my relation. The poetry of medical discourse going against type, pushing past the supposed Anglo-Saxon valorize of the English language and hurtling whole hog into the Latinates, reveling in the Latinates, deciding that if this ancient language was medicine, then I would make poetry of this fading material, a language perpetually fading from the world and yet somehow foundational to it, a poetry not as a way to resist biomedicine or as part of an academic meme to resist biomedicine, but as a way to understand biomedicine, to plumb its lack, to measure its dimensions and meter, but also to measure myself against it, to perhaps learn why it conceived of my kind as lacking for so long, as constructed in lack, of lack. My kind, autistics, as an absence of the human, to use poetry to apprehend an epistemology that rendered the body-mind as data, as quantity. But above all else, to write poems that were good, comprised of that which I was said to lack. Essentializing communication, to feel my way into composition, to write of love and care as if they were the right and left hand rubbing together, trying to create warmth, warming the world, inciting it to care, to write as those I had read wrote, to write like Nolan and Lowell and Acorn and Lane, to try to say a thing as if the meaning itself had a secret it would disclose in a single arrangement, to make sense of being where I was at that point in time, but not in opposition to medicine. Poetry was rarely found in medical spaces then, 1996 to 2000, and so unformalized that I had yet to find a purchase and critique of biomedicine. So I used it to understand only, not as a tool, not as a balcony to pontificate. I had my own other craft. Why not think that medicine is also poetry? Why not agree? Metaphor is a base property of the language, allowing understanding to occur, a precondition of care, allowing for one thing to be posited to be like another to have some necessary quality of likeness that allows a commensurate identification, not a complete one. Poetry in all of us, in everything. Isn't it some kind of animating force? Poetry is a way that meaning is made, non-linearity and spatial possibility, infinitude. Even biomedicine in this respect is poetry. We must grant it that. It can never know everything, it will always fail. Poetry is failure and fail better. The poetry in that little black book returned to me a decade later was a failure, so simple and end stopped, so regularized and columnar. But my so beautiful for all that, a message in a bottle suddenly delivered 10 years later, non-linearly though, it just appeared and said, hey, here I am, I'm poetry. You love me once, look, I'm back to care for you, an avatar of care from the past. How did I set it down? Did I take it out of my stiff lab coat because it pulled too much in my pocket whenever I sat down? It did. Did I place it on the counter so that I could sit next to a patient in their semi-private room? How lovely the young man who bothered to write this book for me. How unusual his habit. How much he loved trying to make something. How much he wanted to help others too. How much he didn't know. How much he feared what he didn't know. For that young man wanted to know everything he could, because knowledge was power, his mentor said, unwittingly bringing forward an idea from 1970s era Michel Foucault, even though the original formulation by Foucault was power knowledge. 
but also because the young man thought that knowing meant having less to fear, whereas the opposite is true. Poetry is a means to knowing, less so an accumulator of knowledge. You think he might have known that as knowledge accumulates, there is only a greater limit, an awareness of a larger set. We come to know what we don't, are brought to awe that fact. And this is also poetry. The tenses, I'm afraid, are broken up and breaking down. The nonlinear flux flattens time to simultaneity, three in one, past, present, future. Ryan. Kidneys are fickle lumps. They need their water and salt just so. Cats who demand dollops of wet flesh to palate dry pellets. The nephron loops with elegance, deep and medullary. We've emulated those soft clods in a whirring, whirling tower, drawing sanguine sips from gnarled vessels. They will not forgive a woman with no gifts from the world. They may not take her, but will chip away at her resolve to quash all the other ailments. Peau de range, dimpled breast announcing neoplasm, leg locked below the knee, further festering with organisms that we groomed for resilience. And this is Thunder Bay. Northward, over patched land, protected, crowned, towards the Thunder Bay Emergency Department to learn and serve and to stitch. At Agawa, I asked the boy who fed my machine with gas, who owned the place? Tourists milled around, racks of Baja sweaters, carvings, beadwork, tobacco shop Indian. Are they indigenous? You'd think the way it's laid out, he said. Do you get to keep your tips, I asked. I frightened in my aloneness further up, for, further up the northern shore. Rock rose all round, no people, just scrubby jack pine. Their cones need fire to bloom and spread their seed, forest born anew. Deepest drink on earth, Lac Superior Kichigami, flashing dull blue on high passes. 1970, Port Arthur and Fort William got sewn together. Worst thing that ever happened, a neighbor told me the joining of these boroughs. They made one city painfully divided and watched by a sleeping Nana Bojo. How many sutures did I lay in Thunder Bay? Tracks along lacks made by glass, baseball bats. 11 for Ojikri lessons. Kasheka waniku win, goko o'o. We said miigwech and Bojo, his eyes heavy under hematoma. 34 for les habitants âgés brought by EMS from a crack house, nose broke and pissed clean. Money all in the bank, thieves got not a thing. Too deep and 10 not so for dog bit boy, screamed for the freeze, mo mom somewhere between there and Sault Ste. Marie. And an unspeakable mark, a violence that cannot be sewn shut, swabbed and drawn and prophylaxed, pulled together only with, I'm sorry, no one deserves what happened to you. A hearty failure in wound edge approximation. Southward, my requisite hours completed on the swath of black rock that eased my machine and my hound dog home. Land gutted on either side, set to carry and spill bitumen across this country. Two lines, yellow, parallel, not to cross, sometimes dashed like a string of beads, two rows unheeded. Biomedical time, four to seven, residency. Beyond the memoir details of which more can be said, notwithstanding the personal details of illness compounded on strangeness, and the special location where the medical learning occurred, in Newfoundland and Nova Scotia. I must stick to the why of medical poetry as it pertains to this faux developmental stage. 
I repeat, I must offer you the same why, for why as a question goes back to the origin. And the origin in my case is to stay alive, to keep understanding, to gather information, to refine my thinking, especially, especially to keep seeing what is beautiful, to keep seeking that, to keep it close, to stick to it like I did as a child, to perfect that pedagogy of staring and staring and seeing how patterns appear on a page, to hear sound patterns, to perceive thought patterns, to suddenly understand what is meant or might be meant, because the poet approaches the poem like the old proverb, appreciating the elephant like a non-sighted man does with his hands in sections and pieces, the pieces of metonymy. Think of the beautiful as particles, beauty particles, that when assembled create a larger beauty and yet somehow the particle suggests the whole, as if a grain of sand seen for the first time by a fish reveals a possible desert, a whole other way of life. But the whole perceived riot of knowledge, the sheer sudden image, the emergent clarity that comes from understanding how pieces are pieces of pieces, and then they all come together of their own accord. This recurring over and over again as part of a lifelong practice of reading that is enfolded in a larger and more friendly being, meaning ontology. How caring for something means recognizing it is only a part of something to care for that is larger. Some other knowledge to come, a broader relation. For example, that poetry informed my learning as a medical student and so it informed my learning while working as a resident physician. One's relations with patients, one's interactions with other healthcare providers, one's house calls, Every one of these an opportunity to be knocked sideways by the world. As I too am knocked sideways by my own sense, the detours it takes, the world in my mind being evasive and evading, and poetry somehow bridging them, allowing them to pass to one another. For some, the training period causes a separation from art or more distance. Hence, I've made a new paragraph here as suggested to me by poetry, by thinking of words in space, by thinking in terms of form. For some, medical novitiates need to focus, to concentrate on their vocation. But because poetry was never an accessory for me, rather the default program running, my encounters with patients and information became only more intense, more reading, more reading as poetry, more interactions, more interactions as poetry, more unruly affect also poetry. Poetry subsuming all categories, all realms of my experience, conceived as a deism perhaps, but a lexical one. And yet to say so to an examiner, to write in this way on a certification exam would be misunderstood at best and be cause for concern at worst. But isn't poetry all around us? Always all around us. In patients and doctors and in drugs, in words on prescription pads, and on the walls of a signature, even in searchable EMRs, search word love, in the snow outside the hospital. Go look at the snow, I beseech you, it's beautiful. It has more knowledge than this essay could tell. I do have an item to impart though, something more profound perhaps, than go be in the world. One may, might even call this item useful. New paragraph, because poetry said there needs to be an ironic distance between the juxtaposition of beauty and a use for the useless. All I know can be simplified as wring a maximum of meaning from the world. Differ from William Carlos Williams, who in Patterson wrote, no ideas but in things. Say instead, no ideas but in relation. It's a point of pride for me that the kind of medicine I eventually chose to practice enshrines the primacy of good relationships with others in its tenets. I never liked red. I've always been more blue. Ultramarine, fallow, cerulean, occasionally anthraquinone. He had me reading red aloud. Garion with his feathered wings pressed into his back and his Achillean desire for he Heracles. Miming mine, not sapphic, but hermaphroditic for E. 
wanting this precise joining of mask and femme that run together to inform that tender being. Their copy got lost in a breakup. The hardcover that we read was long overdue from Hamilton Public Library. Later, I bled a drop on it. This clinched its keeping. But first I ordered it at the bookshop for our first solstice together. It never came. We carried on with our overdue tome. The following summer, we finished it. Gary and got to Argentina and we were on the beach. E in the Muskoka chair, pelvis forward and in deep lean. Me on my, me on my side in decubitus in the sand. Hill of my hip high above my waist. Dying day fire keeping us there in cool August dusk. I scanned the shore for lit lamps, children playing, barking dogs, none on the weeknight in late summer. The bay was ours. And this is Chris Averill. Little cries released louder with, with each exhale until a sharp howl like a hound dog demanding dinner, deconditioned of wildness and solitude, those muscles for killing, pulling back cheek flesh and taking a strange mate, cachectic, forgotten, myocytes releasing their contents to clog up the filtration. Now belly distended, squishy and kept, soft parts presented for proper rubbing and still awaiting offerings of meals of poise sheesh, Master is gone, no box of dried meat from which to measure, scoop, and loudly dump sustenance into a stainless steel bowl. No warm pleasure is delivered straight onto the body. Waiting for their return as one might glance up at each new entrant in a bar in a foreign city for, for a familiar face that never appears. Regression to ferality is the sole task to halt the whining breaths, which tax only the utterer's throat and touch no other's ears. And finally, this is sunroom or later called first wave. The child next door cries relentlessly for her mama. This compels me. I too would like the warm squish of my mother's breast. I don't know why this child can't have hers. They are isolating together. Her mother, like her grandmother with graying raven hair is under the same roof. Perhaps she's on a weekly trip for supplies or is tending to the new baby. I can hear them from my glass box tacked to the side of the house. Molly's plants left here before she fled to New Brunswick where the dog would have more space to roam in her last months. Physical distancing meaning less in wide open marsh and forest. At first, even the plants were isolated. I was afraid to mingle hers and mine in case of another sort of disease. They have done their 14 days and then lots. I'd have to look at the calendar to know how long it's been. Long enough that they're allowed near my heart leaf philodendron, which is putting out a bronze leaf daily. Long enough to know that I should be dating. This box is where I watch spring creep out and make phone calls to my patients to discuss their fear, their hypertension, their bacterial vaginosis, what Premier Ford said today when they can see their children. I make small cups of tea, eat knockoff petite equilier biscuits while they explain their problem. While I listen and the diagnoses bump up and down on the list in my head, I don't think about E and I don't cry unless my patient's problem is the same as theirs was, is. Archer comes in demanding this or that, nosing at a terracotta pot to force my attention. I can kneel and wipe his paws of spring mud while my patients tell me when the pain started, what provokes, what palliates. Me nodding my head without their seeing. Still his dirty, dirty paw prints smear the hardwood, his spring shed showing in its three colors against the usual red-brown. Some weeks I go to the office and sit alone in the tiny windowless exam room with my so soggy surgical mask carefully folded inside a paper bag. This goes against every urge. This is a dirty object that I want to carefully remove, thumbs pulling loops forward directly into the garbage as I was trained. But there's only one for me, so I will don it for weighing newborns or examining a goopy eye. 
Hensley for diagnostics only, the therapeutic now deemed superfluous, risky. Other weeks I watch fat morning doves preening and cooing on my ugly garage's shingled roof, goldfinches in the ginkgo, a gray squirrel wiping his greasy paws on my barbecue tools. He wanted to tear down that garage. I said that instead we would move to a house we both love when residency was over and I would make more money. In the meantime, they tidied up this glass box, took down the horrid organza window dressings. They prepared it for me before they knew they'd leave or that we'd be housebound apart. Some days I run with shit form through the forest overlooking Coots Paradise for the promise of better brain chemicals to ease DSM 5309.0F43.21. Archer and I stop and watch the glittering funnel of light upon the lake. How does that third reflection look in my sopping eyes? The sun sets over the arboretum across the inlet where E once picked a fall bouquet that I have yet to bin. The scrappy native plants have dried and now pepper their detritus over their milk glass bud vase. Doll's eyes, they're poison, we were told. On days that the trails are slick with rain and the sun is a silver disc behind a sheet of marbling cloud, we just walk smiling and veering widely at and from neighbors. I've come to love this sunroom, the place where I diagnose without the laying of hands, my dog's head resting against my thigh and contamination is just the old fashioned kind. Now in the evenings, there might be orange wine and homemade lasagna, but soon it's back to the hospital, hot mask, cracked skin and sick patients whose hands I still cannot hold. Biomedical time, seven uh, to now and beyond. Now the academy, the recognition that biomedicine is ascendant and that redress is required. Is something lost in the redress? Poetry is uninvited participant to narrative medicine's party. Poetry is mere decoration and adornment, is frivolous frill, as eminently optional an enrichment curriculum, as never read part of a companion curriculum, as my grade school experience killed this art ritual statement overheard in spaces reserved for the humanities and medicine. Poetry is the embarrassment that must be patronized in health humanities spaces. The thing that could lose the hearts and minds of possible allies more amenable to narrative, more seduced by the practicalities of competence. Sorry, poetry. Always sorry for poetry. About poetry. Poetry is esoteric art that is both quintessence of the human as well as embarrassing romance, where there is work to be done, healing to effect. For their part, however, must the larger health humanities be invoked as a general good in the face of biomedicine, as a commonly accepted positivity that is lacking in a vague but somehow recognized way? Must space be held in such a cloying manner for the humanities and medicine as if medicine wasn't always, as I have been always, shot through with humanity, comprised of it? Yes, I hereby signal that old chestnut, the art of medicine. Yes, I bring up the origin story historical recognition of medicine's basis in art. Only laterally, the mid-19th century, say, was medicine reconfigured with a pretension to science, gift-wrapped to the culture as a panacea, as curative. What's under the surface is poetry, which is hardly curative. Poetry is mess, as commingling, as body and spirit and mind, as emotion and form, and as technique to plumb some other self, some righteous divining of a beyond subjectivity. That other self looks like it wants to relate, but a moment passes and the other self is staring into a computer screen, entering data into an electronic medical record. In the teaching spaces of the medical institutions and conglomerates, should poetry be required to show its papers? Must there be a disclaimer, a welcome statement, ground rules set for the admittance of this relic of an earlier age in health humanities seminars? or health humanities learnings, or health humanities frolics by the sea. 
Or should the requirement be an outright apology for bringing forward an arcane right that only some prefer, that only some understand? There's a problem in thinking that poetry constitutes art's perfect opposite to an instrumentalist medicine due to poetry's utter uselessness, its general inapplicability, the make nothing happen, oddness rigmarole that of course is completely misunderstood, but also true enough. Poetry won't do anything other than be itself. Yet in medical education spaces, I often think we don't complain about an inability to use the oxygen that surrounds us for any more than it's for. We don't complain that the floor is useless because it holds us up. We don't think of gravity as useless because it is already performing the function that it's supposed to perform, or at least the function that we are used to, that we take for granted. And poetry is doing that which it is supposed to do, sitting behind eyes, under tongues, whispering in ears, like so much else, it too is inert, is just there, in the sense that gravity is inert and yet there. Without it, where would we be? How do we know this world without poetry is unacknowledged legislator of our rules of apprehension? Remove poetry from the world and what is left? What relations are lost? How would we even be able to understand a world without poetry since all we know is a world with it? How could we know a world that had such lack? How could we describe the lack with a vocabulary stripped of the means to understand it? I can never know the world as a narrativist would. Am I also stripped from that world? There's a difference to medical poetry for me now, the why of it from before. I admit it, something has changed more than just an increasing disdain for the encroaching instrumentalism of medicine upon poetry. Something more meaningful than that, a more intense relation. For the past 10 years, I've been exploiting pathological thinking, the kind taught to me by my trade, so-called medical gaze, and place that in conversation with disabled lived experience. I bring impairment and enablement together to conceive of the world as social and material, as commingling, such that poems wonder not at how blunt an instrument medicine is, but how bluntly we wield it, how bluntly we prefer it to be, praying it be a scalpel our forefathers foretold in their most dystopic curative dreams, one that might cut out all the unwanted. Medicine is instead the curious development of a relation, a relation between patient and caregiver, as well as a relation between bodies and space, and a relation between the untold and unknown, a relation that ultimately finds consummation in the application of hands, the strange fact that despite the best efforts of statistics and eugenics and the normal curve, there is an individual and there is a caregiver and there's a relation. And poetry informs that relation, can ratify it, can make it one of care. Yes, there are systems. Yes, there's data. Yes, skill. Yes, capital. Turn towards these all you like, allow them into your definitions. You can never deform the fact that ineradicably, we are to our others as they are to us. I'm a doctor to some, I cherish that. And poetry is a way of exploring and honoring that relation. Wow, wow, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Shane, and thank you so much, SK. Um, I feel very nourished by these that poetry and, and as well as Shane's um, narrative. And uh, I hope all of you do as well. Um, it is 6.40 right now, so I do think that we have a couple minutes for questions or comments or praise. Um, if anyone would like to unmute or drop something in the chat, um, Let's let's give it a couple minutes, see if any anyone has anything that they would like to share. But ultimately, I'd really like to give my thanks to our presenters that were here today. Um, and I'm going to drop a link in the chat myself that if you want to provide any feedback on our cross pollinations event, we have a little survey. It, 
doesn't seem like anyone is raising their hand, but I'll give it one minute more to see if a chat is coming in. Yes, I was, I chuckled at that uh, New Brunswick comment, Shane. <laughs> um, Sarah, yes, go right ahead. Oh, sorry, you're muted. Sorry, I always think that asking questions is uh, a sign of ultimate appreciation and respect for a stunningly beautiful presentation. So just first and foremost, thanks so much, SK, and thanks so much, Shane. Uh, I thoroughly enjoyed that. Um, maybe more for Shane, but SK, I suspect that you have something to reflect on uh, in an answer to this question. But I'm curious um, if either of you have any thoughts on the future of co-mingling and cohabitation of poetry and medicine. Um, I just gave a talk recently with Wendy Stewart's shop out of Dalhousie. I think you may both know her, uh, colleague and fellow uh, intrepidor sort of individual in health humanities. And one of the things that I brought forward was a um, discussion by post-colonial theorist Homi Baba, who quite some time ago really problematized the two kinds of interdisciplinarities that he sees swirling about in the humanities. Well, he problematized one and offered two. Uh, he called one interdisciplinarity one, where sort of disciplines are shoved together with all of their uh, weaknesses intact, thereby enlarging a disciplinary base, but not in any way, shape or form working at the kind of liminal uh, crises moments that are, I think, at the edges of disciplines, instead just kind of shoving these two things together with all of their inherent weaknesses and going forward, essentially amplifying the weaknesses of both disciplines, as opposed to an interdisciplinary two, where there's this inherent understanding of disciplines being in crisis and trying to come up with brand new modes in these moments of crises that don't simply take one thing and use it to garland another thing, garland being Homi Baba's uh, reflection on the risks of interdisciplinarity one. So all of that is to query SK and Shane, what your thoughts are on risks associated with bringing poetics into medicine or conversely medicine into the humanities and how we might um, mitigate, account for, and hopefully uh, not, um, not enliven those risks. I don't think anyone could have planted a better question for Shane. Um, did you two collude? <laughs> so we're always in collusion. <laughs> <laughs> no. Honestly, that was a fantastic question. I'm just thinking about it. Um, my my first thought, I mean, it, to to kind of make a metaphor, it sounds like the first interdisciplinary one. I like that. It's like a undergraduate course, you know, in university interdisciplinarity one and two. Um, one being like some sort of bad tasting soup. You, you throw a couple of ingredients in, and it tastes bad. Um, and the second uh, being misapprehension, confusion of uh, what things are. Um, I, I don't, I have interdisciplinarity three, I guess, or zero. And the, I, see, I see them really as, as being very uh, homologous. Um, I think the narrative is that looking upon medicine um, in time. Uh, it's a way of thinking that uh, isn't necessarily anti-poetry, but it's not, it's not contiguous with it necessarily. Um, but thinking of things non-linearly in space, you're already, uh, you're already thinking of things differently, right? And so <clears throat> because I see these things as, as equivalences possibly or or, or bearing a very intense relation to one another, I don't see them as either one or two. Um, I, I see them as similar. And I think it's, the, it's this weird science, capital S turn that started, you know, as you know, with the natural sciences in the 17th century and has progressed up to the present biomedical kind of uh, hegemony uh, that thinks of poetry as this uh, antithetical or somehow the opposite of what 
medically people do. And it isn't, you know, it isn't, uh, as you know, um, biomedicine works according to metaphors. All knowledge is constructed uh, based on metaphor. And um, not recognizing that, I think, is, a, is not understanding what medicine is, not understanding what science is. Um, and I mean, I can cite the books, you know, um, uh, that lead to that lead to my thinking in this way. But ultimately, I, I'd say there's a lot um, that's similar, and maybe getting that message across uh, would be an important um, message to be able to deliver to medical people. But even then, you're too far along. The culture primes us to think in this way. It starts very very early and uh in some ways we've given the game away you know long before people ever ever enter medical school um there are some solutions that are possible in bringing more people into medicine um from the arts and humanities and of course that's been a turn that's been going on for a while um there are other ideas too that i have um that i'm already talking too long ultimately you know getting meaningful work like you're doing with this series, um, getting uh, medicine infiltrating into, sorry, getting poetry and uh, the humanities infiltrating into medical schools in an intrinsic way, um, having people there that are there, their period, they have offices or they're doing work within hospitals or universities and sharing it. And it seems like it's intrinsic to the process, not some sort of strange uh, decoration. Hopefully that with some kind of answer. Yeah, a garlanding. I'm just curious, Shane, and again, um, uh, please feel free to jump in. Um, do you think there's something that the humanities can learn from medicine and something that the humanities and poetry can learn from medicine? I, I always think there's a bit of a risk of medicine, however garlandy-ish, possibly parasitically sort of pulling from humanities but I often wonder about like when I teach in creative writing to be honest they're not thinking much about what they can learn from medicine they think a lot about how medicine should listen more to them and I, I don't disagree with that but I, but I kind of wonder what happens when we flip it on its head and I apologize if I interrupted anybody out there in the zoom world I'll be quiet after this question it's another great question but I just turned to turned to SK and um I've got an answer, but do you have anything um, yeah. to that question? I think um, I think something that comes to mind is is urgency. Um, you know, as we as we become clinicians, we we have a, a I think a, a very salient sense of urgency in what we do and um, urgency and and importance and poignance, um, and I think relating to many of the the arguments that chain makes around this um perhaps the humanities could draw some of that urgency into how they understand the importance of what of what they do and what they produce that's great i love it thanks sk i love that answer and and there's two there's two things i'd say um in addition the first is I often hear about people who come from the humanities into medicine um, and they say, you know, I did this because I wanted to do something. I actually wanted not just to think about things abstractly or teach or something like that. I actually wanted to have, move into a career where I could intervene, where I could do something. And, you know, if you follow up with those people years later, doing things is not all it's cracked up to be, <laughs> you know? Um, and people uh, long in the tooth in medicine often reflect upon um, the doing of things. And oftentimes it's not doing anything that's often the most uh, useful thing, just thinking uh, about situations. So it kind of just is a sort of boros. And the second, um, the second thing I'd say is the very great lesson I think medicine could provide the humanities is the perils of instrumentalism, right? Thinking that everything has to have an outcome thinking that things have to be measured, that everything that we do has to be accounted for in terms of efficacy. The beans must be added up. 
that you must have a an RCT that shows that jumping out of an airplane, you should have a parachute, right? Outcome. Outcome. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, and you know, measuring the descent and then the uh, the effectiveness of the parachute as it uh, as it moves, you know, um, that. but the the arts are moving that way, especially poetry. It is uh, completely pivoting towards its work in the world, its perception as an intervention. And I mean, I do that work too in terms of disability, but I do fret a little bit about this ghastly turn um, in poetry towards an instrumentalist. Uh, use in terms of representing identity. Um, I I do that work too. I play that game as well, but I do see it pivoting, old, like I do see it turning that way without an eye possibly to like good old, good old capital B beauty or something. And it used to be the humanities which freed us from having to think of an instrumentalist kind of outcome, right? Uh, so I think that gazing upon medicine uh, from the humanities and, and recognizing that kind of um, peril. I know that's a negative thing. I know it's a negative thing, but um, it, is a, it is a possible lesson as I walk through, through both worlds. I wanted to acknowledge some of that wisdom you just shared, Shane, um, that was echoed in a mentor from emergency medicine, uh, I guess originally from Toronto, who said, don't just do something, stand there, <laughs> in response to what it is to uh, wait and see. And uh, overdoing uh, sometimes that is uh, so wrapped up in harm. Said the, said the surgeon to the internist, goes yeah. the joke. Yeah. <laughs> yes. But also to take a playbook, uh, a page from the playbook uh, that Sarah was referring to before as far as a question uh, as a way of showing gratitude, um, as well as one uh, to champion the alignment of poetry in the basic science years, thinking about the harm of doing too much. Uh, but in that space of patient safety, medical harm, thinking now what you both might think around the need for licensing and you know practicing poetry without a license <laughs> what, what might be the social accountable approach to having uh, licensing authorities for <laughs> for bringing into the fold um, well well established uh, competencies uh, for for bringing both the written and spoken uh, recited verse into the world safely I think that's such an interesting question for the two of us because um, Shane has certainly received his poetry license um, with his big, big bad PhD. Um, uh, and I'm an unlike, I've been practicing poetry unlicensed um, for the better part of my life. Um, so, I mean, I, narratively, I think that's a, that's sort of a, a funny, uh, fun thing to think about. I, I'm not sure if, um, if you mean it earnestly, I, if you're, I'm curious. Well, it is just, again, a manner of social accountability and, and how it's been said that you know, there's no such thing as bad art except for that art that leaves one indifferent. Um, mm. So how, how to bring in a, a level of authenticity alongside of the mentorship allows or even the apprentice approach apprentice style approach that has been in medicine now for for centuries why not why not also um, bringing that uh, accountability into well, the sharing i guess the, to me the most obvious why not would be accessibility um that would be that the sort of obvious why not but curious what shane has to say i'm ambivalent um in terms of, i'm i'm Bivalent about most, you know, dial, thinking dialectically, I guess. Um, I completely understand what you mean, and I wince and cringe often internally, you know. At the same time, I celebrate the fact that poetry is being venerated, that somebody's actually trying, that somebody's uh, making something, that somebody's taking uh, enjoyment in it. Um, I completely understand what you mean, and I do very much. I, 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 I cultivate, I guess, a concern looking at bad poetry 
in what I would subjectively deem as bad poetry, recognizing that it is completely subjective and comes from my lived experience often um, in medical journals. Um, it's not very interesting formally. It usually knows nothing about form or deployment on the page. Um, it knows nothing about meter, if it even deigned to bother with it. Uh, it's often written about the very first experience one had as a doctor in terms of encountering some sort of diagnosis. Uh, it often centers the medical data. Uh, I, I understand what you mean. And I think the pedagogy has to kind of walk some sort of recognition that this is a thing that you, you, you devote yourself, some people devote themselves to, but at the same time, um, it can be a vehicle for creativity. So being snooty is troublesome, but also recognizing that, you know, it's not just poetry, like in the health humanities, there are scholars, right, that do this, that do this work, that have read vast amounts of books and think, uh, think very deeply and widely. And, you know, it's, it's medicine's um, kind of prejudice to see one, do one, you know, uh, that sort of thing. It's, it is that way. I think it is that way, but it also isn't. And maybe, maybe recognizing the complexity there, uh, it can be taught very badly in narrative medicine seminars. You know, a poem can be slapped up and everyone can congratulate themselves on their um, reflective humanity by pointing out a few observations about a poem. Um, but this is me being kind of a jerk, uh, but also at the same time celebrating that it's even there and that medical people are thinking in a different way. Um, so the credentialism uh, goes both ways. Both the humanities and medicine share that peril, but it's often medicine using um, poetry in a very uh, cursory and uh, very cursory way. Uh, that can lead to the production of a lot of bad art, but you wouldn't accept a lot of bad doctors performing a lot of bad medicine. They are out there, I guess, but you wouldn't kind of say, oh, well, they're just, they're just doing their thing, you know? So I get what you mean, but it's, it's tricky. And I just think it needs to be sensitively engaged with the recognition that it's, it's a, it's a, it's a lifelong practice for many. You know? Thank you. Amazing. That was some really enthusiastic responses. I enjoyed that kind of play between um, everyone in the chat as well as who contributed through audio. Um, I'm just going to tell everyone that it's seven o'clock. So I think that this might be a, well, seven o'clock Ontario time, uh, that this might be a perfect time to wrap up. So thank you so much again to SK and Shane and to all of you for joining us. I hope you had a great evening. I certainly did. Um, and may you all uh, have a lovely poetry filled rest of your week. <laughs> um, the recording will be emailed to you in case you want to revisit any of our fun stuff that happened this evening. And Laura, thanks for doing a great job facilitating us. That was tremendous. Thank you, Sarah. <laughs> all right. Take care, everyone. Thanks. Bye.